stories making headlines at this hour. It is the last day of this month's extraordinary session in Korea's National Assembly. Which bills received the green light and which did not? We have the details. It's an apparent effort to protest ongoing South Korea U.S. military drills. It's an attempt to win badly needed foreign investment and aid. From South Korea's response to outside analyst views, we have an analysis of what Pyongyang's intentions were firing short-range missiles into the East Sea last night. And Koreans have been battling thick, noxious smog for the past week, and the airborne particles from China continue to pose health threats. How can we better protect ourselves from these health hazards? We speak to an expert, coming right up on Primetime News. Good evening and welcome to Primetime News. It's Friday, February 28th here in Korea. Live from Seoul, I'm Moon Gun Young. And I'm Sean Lim. Thank you so much for joining us. We begin with the latest 180 degree flip in inter Korean relations. They seem to be heading back on the right track with the successful cross border family reunions earlier this week. That is until last night when Pyongyang launched four short range Scud missiles into the East Sea. Arirang News Kim Yeonbin reports on this recent maneuver from the north. The South Korean Defense Ministry said Friday that North Korea's latest missile launch seems to have been planned to coincide with the start of Seoul's annual military drills with Washington. The ministry said the North had fired four projectiles, which, considering their speed and direction, are presumed to have been short range Scud missiles. This is the North's first Scud missile launch in five years. The launch also follows an incursion by a patrol boat over the de facto maritime border between the two countries on Monday which the Seoul's defense minister said at that time was sent to test the South Korean military. Given its timing coming right after the inter-Korean family reunions and the ongoing key resolve drills, we believe that the North's missile launch was very intentional and a type of provocation. The ministry said the South Korean military is prepared for any provocations from the North. Just hours before the launch, Seoul had proposed a round of Red Cross talks to resolve humanitarian issues, including reunion for families separated by the Korean War. Seoul's unification ministry said on Friday that it is looking to see if the launch would affect inter-Korean relations and the talks that are expected to be held as early as next week. On top of that, a private organization had recently offered to send supplies and food aid to the North, worth nearly 180,000 U.S. dollars. With the recent improvement of inter-Korean relations, some experts believe the North executed the launch to gain some leverage during negotiations between the two Koreas. Other experts believe that this was a protest against the strong condemnation of the North's nuclear program and human rights violations by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. Either way, the South Korean government is keeping a close eye on the situation and plans to set up countermeasures against future provocations. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. South Korea's unification ministry says North Korea has so far refused to accept a message regarding a South Korean missionary who has been detained by the North since last October. The ministry said it tried on Friday afternoon to send a message urging Pyongyang to release Kim Jong-uk and to ensure his safety until repatriation. The uh, North released video footage on Thursday of a press conference in which Kim claimed to be a South Korean spy. Kim said he entered North Korea four months ago with the aim of building an underground church in the North Korean capital. The United Nations World Food Program reportedly provided North Korea with some three million U.S. dollars worth of emergency food aid earlier this month. Washington-based Radio Free Asia reports that the U.N. Food Agency supplied emergency assistance for children and pregnant women in the North due to a drop in donations from the international community. Now, the U.N. body is currently trying to collect $200 million earmarked for the two groups in the North by 2015, but has only collected around $25 million so far. It estimates that 84 percent of all North Korean households have borderline or poor food consumption. 
In a strong message to Japan over recent historical and territorial disputes, China designated two national days to highlight the wrongs committed by Japan during World War II. Chinese officials say the move is a strong statement against any future wars. For more on this story, we turn to our Park ji -won. Amid continued tensions in Northeast Asia over historical and territorial issues, China's Standing Committee of the National People's Congress has designated two national days to highlight Japanese aggressions during the Second World War. The Chinese government singled out September 3rd as Victory Day in the war against Japanese aggression to coincide with Japan's surrender to the Allied forces in the Second World War on September 2nd, 1945. China also designated December 13th as the day to remember victims of the Nanjing Massacre. Japanese forces captured the Chinese city of Nanjing on December 13, 1937, and for a six-week period carried out crimes against humanity on the city's citizens. The estimated number of people killed by Japanese troops during the incident ranges from 40,000 to over 300,000. The Chinese Foreign Ministry said the days show the Chinese government is determined about its national sovereignty, territorial stability, and its opposition against any aggressive wars. It also sends a strong message to Japan that any attempts to challenge the post-Second World War order by denying the nature of Japanese aggressions will never be tolerated. The ministry also warned about the resurgence of Japanese militarism and called for Japanese leaders to take a responsible approach toward the matters of history. Meanwhile, Japanese Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga said Friday that the government will be setting up a special investigative team to re-examine the 1993 Kuno Statement, which apologized to six slaves during the Second World War and acknowledged that Japanese forces were responsible. Despite criticisms within Japan, such as from former Prime Minister Tomichi Murayama, that such a re-examination will rile up neighboring countries like South Korea, the Japanese government has apparently decided to move ahead with the plans. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Turning now to the latest from crisis hit Ukraine. A group of heavily armed men have reportedly taken over two airports in the Ukrainian region of Crimea. Kiev has blamed Moscow for a sudden occupation of the pro-Russia region despite reassurances of non-interference from the Kremlin. Our Polly reports. Ukraine's interior minister Arsen Avakov has accused Russia of an armed invasion, denouncing the move as a violation of international agreements. Avakov said the large force of armed men who he claims are Russian soldiers arrived at the Sevastopol military airport in Ukraine's region of Crimea on Friday morning. The airport is located near Russia's Black Sea Fleet naval base. Eyewitnesses say the men dressed in full battle gear carrying assault rifles and Russian flags took control of the airport backed by armored vehicles. The other main Crimean airport in Sanfiropol was also occupied on Friday by armed men who also appear to be pro-Russia militia. It remains unclear whether the seizure is the initial stage of a larger military operation or if it's simply to stall Ukrainian authorities from exerting greater control over the autonomous region. The Russian military has denied that its forces were involved in the seizing of the airports. Earlier, Ukraine's new government in Kiev had warned any movement by Russian forces beyond the base's territory would be tantamount to aggression. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov moved to assure U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry that Russia will respect Ukraine's territory. Other Western nations like Britain and Germany are also calling on Russia to help ease the turmoil in Ukraine's Russian-dominated region. On Thursday, the new Ukrainian government held its first cabinet meeting led by newly appointed Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsunyuk. In the meantime, ousted President Viktor Yanukovych is said to be in Russia. Russian state news agencies are reporting that he plans to hold a news conference on Friday. He has declared he is still Ukraine's president, but has lost support across almost the entire country. Paul Yi, Arirang News. Over in Seoul's National Assembly, lawmakers passed a series of long-pending bills as this month's extraordinary session wrapped up today. But they remain divided over a controversial revision to the nation's pension system. Our National Assembly correspondent, Ji Myung-gil, has the details. 
Lawmakers in the National Assembly passed a series of key livelihood bills on Friday, the last day of this month's extraordinary session. Among the bills passed was a revision to the Personal Information Protection Act, which requires financial institutions and public organizations to encrypt a client's 13-digit identification number when storing them in a database. The Parliamentary Security Committee has thoroughly revised this bill to fully protect our citizens, and the specifics will be written into a presidential decree. The change was made in response to a massive data leak last month, affecting some 20 million card holders at three credit card firms and millions more clients at financial institutions in the months prior to that. Lawmakers also passed a bill that will allow the parliament to more swiftly appoint an independent counsel for investigations into an array of sensitive crimes ranging from corruption to wrongdoing by government agencies. The bill creates a parliamentary standing committee that will be responsible for making the independent council appointments. In the past, a new committee was created for each new appointment. The standing committee for appointing independent councillors will consist of seven government officials. The bill also allows the formation of a special investigative body charged with monitoring the relatives of the president or senior officials at the presidential office in order to prevent ethical breaches. Lawmakers, however, will not be subject to surveillance. The rival parties were unable to overcome their differences on whether to link the basic pension scheme to the national pension system. That means they failed to put up a vote on a bill that would offer a monthly pension to senior citizens over the age of 65 in the bottom 70 percent of the income bracket. Kim young Arirang News. The final results of an investigation into a massive oil spill off Korea's south coast late last month are in, and the damage was much greater than originally thought. The U.S. Maritime Police announced Friday that the total amount of oil spilled was 754,000 liters. Now that's more than four and a half times greater than the interim estimate. The Maritime Police have set their sights on more than 60 people in relation to the accident. Eight people have already been charged with counts ranging from negligence in the conduct of business and destruction of evidence. The spill occurred after a tanker hit a landing bridge on January 31st as it tried to dock, causing three oil pipelines operated by GS Caltex to rupture. One of Korea's nuclear reactors shut down suddenly earlier this Friday morning. The 950,000 kilowatt Hanbit 2 reactor in Yeonggwang, Jeollanam-do province came to a halt at around 10:50 a.m. State-run plant operator Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power said it is investigating the exact cause of the shutdown, but added that the incident will not interfere with electricity production. This is the first time in seven years the reactor has shut down, and the second nuclear reactor shut down this year following one reported late last month in Uljin, Gyeongsangbuk-do province. Korea has 23 nuclear reactors. With a shutdown today, six are now offline. The air pollution that's been choking Korea over the past week just won't go away. A pre-ultrafine dust warning was issued here in Seoul at 1 p.m. Friday and remains in effect at this hour. Now, such warnings are issued when levels exceed 60 micrograms per cubic meter for more than two hours. But there is some good news. Strong winds from the west are expected to blow the fine dust away from the peninsula this weekend. Until then, children and the elderly are advised to remain indoors and wear masks when they do venture outside. Let's now turn to an expert to find out the cause of this fine dust and what we can do to better protect ourselves from its health hazards. We have with us in the studio Dr. Chong Yun Kyung, occupational physician at the Halim Sacred Heart Hospital. Dr. Jung, it's good to have you with us. Good evening. Well, doctor, we've been hearing quite a few terms relating to this pollution, a dust, fine dust, ultra fine dust. Well, what's the difference and why is ultra fine dust so dangerous? Mm -hmm. The dust is classified by aerodynamic diameter. The fine dust is the defined that the dust diameter of dust is below 10 micrometers. The diameter of ultra fine dust is below uh, 2.5 micrometers. Ultrafine dust uh, is so small and 
uh, to obstruct the terminal airway, so it could be the source of respiratory illness. Now, Dr. Chung, uh, what exactly does this uh, noxious air quality do to the human body, and uh, is the damage permanent? Mm, it's not permanent, but uh, every dust in the lung could be one of the source of the uh, respiratory illness. Uh, mo most of dust could be uh, exhaled, uh, excreted by, with exhaled air and mucosa secretion, but not in case in pine dust. But because the size of pine dust is small and too obstruct airway, so the retention dust could be the source. Uh, source of the less spread disease like bronchitis and asthma. So out on the streets of Seoul, you see a lot of people wearing these masks. Mm -hmm. Are they that effective? Yeah, it is very effective. Uh, according to the report of the Public Research Institute, the coverage rate of uh, masks against uh, yellow dust is uh, above uh, 80%. So, uh, but uh, the best mask is uh, a uh, well-designed and well-pitted mask. If you take a mask, after take a mask, fasten your band of the mask and press around the nose and avoid the leakage. Now, uh, what are some ways that we can better protect ourselves from these uh, health hazards caused by a fine dust uh, um, errors? Now, um, you know, what can we do in our everyday regular lives? Mm -hmm. uh, um, the best way is to prevent more exposure about uh, the dust. Uh, so you have to take a proper mask and avoid outdoor activity. If you have to, you take a proper mask and a uh, well pitted mask. Uh, and uh, in addition, uh, I want to recommend you take uh, enough water, above eight cups in a day. Uh, it promotes to make a mucosa secretion, so it can help uh, help helpful to excrete dust in the lung. All right. Well, doctor, thank you so much for the tips and your expertise. Yeah, thank you so much. The United States is growing increasingly frustrated by Japan's extreme move to the right, and in its yearly human rights report released Thursday, the U.S. called out the use of hate speech against Korean residents living in Japan. For more on that and other stories making headlines around the world, we connect live to our Yu Leon standing by at the News Center. So, Leon, how exactly does the report criticize the use of hate speech against Koreans in Japan? Good evening. The report mentioned that ultra-right groups in Japan have used racially pejorative terms in their protests held in Korean neighborhoods in Tokyo. It adds that Koreans in the capital face discrimination in terms of civil and political rights. Now, there have been growing numbers of hate speech rallies against permanent Korean residents against a backdrop of strained bilateral ties with Korea. The term hate speech even became a top buzzword in Japan last year. But it is very rare for the U.S. State Department to specifically call out Japan, as it could be seen as a criticism of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's shift to the far right. Now, the international community is slashing aid to Uganda for its controversial anti-gay bill that makes homosexual acts illegal and punishable by up to life in prison. The World Bank on Thursday postponed a $90 million loan, which was intended to help strengthen Uganda's health care system. Bank officials said they wanted to ensure that the projects the loan was supposed to support would not be adversely affected by the new law. The decision follows similar moves from Denmark, the Netherlands and Norway. Norway, all of which announced that they were suspending assistance to the country. Now, over in Hollywood, preparations are underway for the biggest night of the year in the entertainment industry. The 87th Academy Awards will take place this Sunday, and unlike previous years, the race for best original song is garnering a lot of attention. Song category is the most interesting category, in my opinion. And it's drawn the biggest campaigning this year. You see U2 on Jimmy Fallon talking about their Oscar nomination. You see Pharrell doing party after party trying to promote this song from Despicable Me Too. I think U2, Karen O, oh, Pharrell, great pedigrees, big rock stars, but the juggernaut that is Frozen is going to wipe them all away. 
Now, Let It Go is, of course, the Oscar nominated song for the movie Frozen, and it has become a YouTube sensation. Some critics are even attributing the movie's success to the song. And that wraps up our look at the international stories making headlines. Hello and welcome to Primetime Sports. I'm Stephen Che. Now we start in Palm Beach, Florida, where the first round of the Honda Classic has kicked off, and Irishman Rory McIlroy has the early lead after a wonderful performance. McIlroy shot two birdies early on and kept steady until the tenth hole when he clicked into full gear. He sank three birdies in a row, finishing off with two more later on to end the day at seven under. It was a sweet redemption for the 24-year-old who walked off the course last year after a terrible start. Now conditions are going to be wet for round two, but the skies will clear up as play continues on through Sunday. Now over to the LPGA. Round two has come to a close at the HSBC Women's Champions in Singapore, and Carrie Webb was able to hold on to her lead. She wasn't as steady as she was in round one, offsetting three bogeys with six birdies, but stayed at the top with a total score of nine under. Now with the two-shot lead over Angela Stanford going into the weekend, Webb is poised to lift her second trophy in three tournaments this year. And heading to the NBA, the Philadelphia 76ers will officially retire Allen Iverson's number three going into the rafters, or rather into the rafters at the Wells Fargo Center on Saturday. Now it'll all go down during a ceremony at halftime of the Sixers-Wizards game, giving a chance for the city of brotherly love to honor one of their all-time greats. Now Iverson, also known as the answer for his ability to score at will, was named MVP in 2001 and was a four-time scoring champion, all as a 76er. And moving on, reports by German broadcaster WDR that some Russian athletes inhaled performance-enhancing xenon gas at the Winter Olympics have prompted the World Anti-Doping Agency, or WADA, to take action. A Russian medical official rebutted the claims, saying that it was not a banned substance under WADA guidelines. Now it's Friday's KBL action. In the first matchup, LG beats Samsung 93-76. But now let's go on to the game of the night. It's the SK Knights taking on Anyang KGC in Seoul. Now KGC gets off to the quick start thanks to a hot Osegun and leads by three at the half. Now down the final stretch, it's all SK and their man Aaron Haynes who lights it up in the fourth quarter. He ends with 29 points on the night and SK wins 82-74. That's all for now. This has been Stephen Che. I'll see you back here later for more from the world of sports. Just when we thought we might have been done with the air pollution, for now at least, a pre-ultra-fine dust warning was issued for the capital this Friday. Well, for more, let's go over to our Kim bo at the Weather Center. Now, bo we really need to uh, get out of this toxic air. That's right, but Seoul is still seeing an ultra pre fine dust warning. Now, Seoul is currently seeing 139 micrograms per cubic meter fine dust. This is about triple the normal level, so those with respiratory problems should continue to take caution. Currently, it's raining in most parts of the southern regions, and through tomorrow, Jeju will get 5 to 30 millimeters of precipitation. 
Nation. Those in both the Cholladu and Gyeongsangdo provinces, along with Dokdo, can expect five millimeters. Moving on to our satellite map, strong winds are blowing in from the west, which will gradually push away all the fine dust by tomorrow afternoon. And tomorrow looks to be a cloudy or drizzly day nationwide, but it will be sunny on Sunday. Next week, things will turn a bit colder again as morning lows are forecast to dip below zero degrees. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul and Gwangju hit nine degrees while Daegu and Busan reached the low teens. As for other regions, Daejeon and Jeju also peak in the low teens while Dokdo and Mount Kumgang top out at seven and one degrees respectively. Guys. Thank you, Pogyoung, for that. And that is our broadcast on this Friday night. I'm Moon Gonyoung in Seoul. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon.